Okay, so picking up from where we left off last time, we're developing algorithms for max flow. And last time uh, we gave first a pseudo polynomial algorithm, right, which is just sort of any old augmenting path. Uh, was pseudo polynomial, which had a runtime of order m times f uh, for flow value f, right? And then we moved on and we considered a max capacity augmenting path. Um, and that found uh, 1 over m of the residual flow per iteration. And so that gave us a running time of order m squared log of the flow value. Uh, and so that was pol that's polynomial, right? Uh, we, we, the, the flow value, of course, being upper bounded by m times u means that this could be written as m squared log of m times u, right, where u is the maximum capacity. And so since you need log u bits to write down a capacity of u, that means that this running time is polynomial in the total size of the problem counted in bits, right? And we similarly saw a scaling uh, augmenting path algorithm, which had a running time of order m squared log u, so just a little bit better than the max capacity augmenting path algorithm. And it, too, is therefore a polynomial time algorithm. Um, but there's some, a quibble with these polynomial time bounds, that there's this strange dependence on the ranges of the numbers. Right? And so like if, if you were thinking about the problem um, more, more, more generally or with, in, sort of in, in less detail, uh, you know, max flow seems to be about a problem where you're just doing additions and subtractions of numbers and uh, you know, computing total values of things. So why should the exact values of the numbers that you are adding and subtracting actually matter? I mean, from an intuitive perspective, it seems like max, I mean, max flow makes perfect sense even when you're talking about real valued uh, capacities on the edges. You can still define a maximum flow. You can still imagine an algorithm for computing a maximum flow. But these running times become meaningless when you're working with real numbers and become awful when you're working with numbers of large magnitudes. So the goal for today is going to be to develop some strongly polynomial algorithms. Which means algorithms that have running times that are polynomial in the structural size of the problem, the number of edges and vertices, independent of the numbers, and in particular independent of the value of u. So that these, pro the, these algorithms will work even for real numbers if you can figure out how to build a computer that can store real numbers. Right. So if we're going to do that, we have to take a rather different approach to the problem, right? Because the, the algorithms that we looked at so far, they, they, it's not an accident that they have running de times dependent on u, right? They measure their progress by contrasting with the numerical value of the flow. So it's no surprise that their overall running time is affected by the numerical value of the flow. So if we're going to have an algorithm that is strongly polynomial, it can't use the flow values and it can't measure its progress against that. And so we're going to need a different way to measure progress towards finding a solution. Okay. So to get there, um, let me start with a black and white notion of progress. Sort of going back to the beginning, what was our sort of criterion uh, for asking whether there is um, a non-zero flow? How did, we, how did we look at a graph and immediately decide whether there is a non-zero flow in that graph? And correspondingly, when we look at a residual graph to decide if we have a max flow, how do we look at the residual graph of the flow and decide whether the flow is a maximum flow or not? What is the dif differentiating, what, what is the easy differentiator? Hmm? 
Yes? Right, so if there's a path, then there's a flow. Okay, so if, somebody wa if we want to tell somebody that there's, a, that there's a flow, then we just show them a path. What if we want to tell them that there is no flow? Yeah? Then we show them a cut. Okay, so there's this sort of explicit thing that we can point at for both cases. Now, if you think about it, that's a very black and white characterization, right? The path tells me that I can get from S to T. Right? The cut tells me that I cannot get from S to T. Can we fill that in a little bit with, with something in between being able to get from S to T and not being able to get from S to T? What might be a sort of a natural measure of how hard it is to get from S to T? Sorry? Good, so a long time, which we usually describe as length, right? So you could think, if you think about it, we say, well, if there's a finite length path, that means there's flow. If, there is no, if, if the distance from S to T is infinite, because there's a cut, then there's no flow. Well, what happens in the middle? What these strongly polynomial time algorithms leverage is that there's a sort of actually sort of a duality between the amount of flow that you can send and the distance between S and T. Okay? And this has a pretty uh, intuitive um, uh, uh, a picture. So if I look uh, at a graph with N, if I tell you that a graph has N edges, each of capacity one, um, I, if I look, think about where the distance is short versus graphs where the distance is large, I can get very different kinds of flows out of those n edges, right? So if I tell you that the distance from s to t is 1, then how much flow can be carried by n edges? Yeah? <coughs> n flow. How, how? What kind of graph do, would that be? Yeah, I can just draw a whole bunch of edges from s to t, right? And here I have n edges connecting s to t. Each of them can carry a unit of flow. Uh, and so there's n flow in this graph. Now what if instead I tell you that the graph has n edges, but the distance from s to t, or n minus 1 edges, and I tell you that the distance from s to t is n minus 1? How much flow can this graph carry? Just 1, because in that case, you've got, a, you've got this long chain. <coughs> Okay. So n edges all with s and t close together can carry n flow. n edges with s and t very far apart can only carry one unit of flow. There's a nice sort of physical intuition here, uh, right? If we think of capacity as the sort of cross-sectional area of these tubes that the internet is made of, right? So the internet's made of tubes, and um, each, of the, each of these tubes has a, has a cross-section. That's the rate, that defines the rate at which uh, information can flow, or water can flow through that tube. Well, if you multiply that cross-section by, by a length, what do you get? You get a volume, right? And so um, the point is that with n edges defined this way, the total volume of my network is n minus 1, or with n minus 1 edges, the total volume of my network is n minus 1. If that volume is associated with a length of 1, then there's lots of cross-sectional area. If that volume is associated with a gr large length, then there's only a little bit of cross-sectional area. And so that sort of gives this trade-off between distance and amount of flow that can be carried. <coughs> so we're going to formalize that. Okay. Um, so we're going to use, and this will become more formal next week, uh, this dual idea as a way to develop a Maxwell algorithm and as a way to make progress. And the idea is that um, when the st distance is large, then not much flow can be delivered from s to t. And in particular, once the st distance reaches n, no flow can be delivered from s to t. How come? Yeah, the maximum length of the path is actually n minus 1. So if the distance is n, then actually it's infinite distance. Th that means there's a cut somewhere in the graph. 
So what we're going to try and do is use our flow out, use our, our algorithm to increase the distance from S to T until so far apart that you can't reach, that, they, that they're, they're unreachable from each other. Okay. So how do we do that? Okay, so we've been working with these augmenting path algorithms, right? Find a path that can carry some flow, push flow along that path, all right? Um, last time we talked about looking for an augmenting path of maximum capacity as a way to make progress. If our goal is to make S and T very far apart from each other, what kind of augmenting path should we look for? Keeping in mind that when we find an augmenting path, we destroy it by sending flow along it, right? So what paths do we want to destroy when uh, we're trying to increase distance? Yes? Short ones. So this takes us to the shortest augmenting path algorithm. Okay, and that's what we're going to study. But actually, my mention of destroying shortest paths reminds me, um, uh, Aloni gave me a wonderful reference that really highlights the duality between max flow and min cut, which I thought I would share with you. Um, the original study of max flow was happening during World War II, George Danzig was looking at um, uh, Mincut. Uh, why was he looking at Mincut? Well, he had this Russian railway network, and um, the army was interested in uh, destroying the railway network, right? And asking, how few, net, how few rail lines do I need to bomb in order to disconnect the Russian railway network? Okay. And at exactly the same time, over in Russia, there were a bunch of scientists studying the Russian railway network, because they were trying to ship stuff on that network and were trying to figure out how, what's the most stuff they could get from point A to B in, in the network. So you had these two people working on the same problem <laughs> in dual form on the same network. So I, I, this is remarkable to me. That, that, um, okay. All right, so coming back to shortest augmenting path. Um, so this is, an, this is a natural thing to do if our goal is to increase distance. But it's not immediately obvious that it does increase distance, right? I find a shortest augmenting path. I destroy that uh, path. You know, in, in, in other words, I saturate one edge on that path. But does that increase the distance? I mean, do, does one shortest augmenting path mean that the next time I'll have a larger, I'll, I'll have a, a longer augmenting path? Does it increase the distance? Does it not decrease the distance? I mean, neither of these is clear, right? It could be that there are two shortest augmenting paths, and I have to kill both of them before the distance goes up. And at least at the start, it appears that maybe if I find a shortest augmenting path, I'll create an even shorter one and not make progress. So we have to prove something. And so here's the uh, sort of key lemma. Um, under this shortest augmenting path algorithm, uh, the distance, uh, which I'll write d, from s to any vertex i, I don't know why I used i, but I did, so I'll be consistent with that, and the distance from i to the sink t is non-decreasing. This is a, uh, a, a relatively low bar. Right? We're going to say that our effort to make the distance grow is at least not going to make it shrink. Okay? Seems like a good start. Okay. So how do we prove this? Well, it's by contradiction. Okay. So let's assume that I got closer to S. And from that, let's derive a contradiction. So what does it mean that I got closer to S? Well, let me define some, some additional uh, quantities. Let's say that I uh, has a predecessor, J, on the new shortest path. In other words, I did a shortest augmenting path, and I discovered this vertex i that got closer to s. And it got closer to s by virtue of a new shortest path where its predecessor on the 
path is j. Okay, so we have a picture that looks like this. From that, I want to derive a contradiction. And it's going to be a contradiction about the relationship between i and j. Okay. Um, ah. So uh, let, me, let me actually refine this. Let's say that i got closer to s um, and is the closest that did so. So among all of the vertices that were brought closer to s by the shortest augmenting path, take the closest one to s. Okay. Now if i was the closest vertex that got closer to s, what does that tell me about j? Not necessarily further. Didn't get closer. OK. So if j didn't get closer, how is it that i got closer? Yes. Um, OK, so that's one way it could have happened, right? Maybe there was a path like this through some vertex k, right, from j to i, and the augmentation destroyed, uh, sorry, but that path existing, that by itself doesn't mean that i got closer to, right? So if this was the picture before the uh, augmentation, i was already this close to uh, s, right? So that, that doesn't quite get at what's going on. Yes? Uh, yes, it's possible for j to equal s, but even so, even so, this picture still, I mean, just the presence of this length 2 path, right, the, the doesn't mean that I, that, that doesn't say that i had to get closer, right? So something else had to happen in order for i to get closer to s. Yes? Right. So the uh, argument is that this edge must be new. Right? Because right, right, j did not get any closer to s. Right? So the, the distance from s to j, I mean, maybe there was a different path from s to j, but it was no shorter than this one, or no longer than this one. So you know, we had this already as a way to get from s to j. So, if this edge had been present before the augmentation, then this would have been a pre-existing shortest path to i. So the only way that i, that, that i got closer, in other words, that this became the shortest path to i, is if this edge was created by the shortest augmenting path. Right? So that implies that edge ij was created by the shortest augmenting path. Now, how can an edge be created in an augmenting path algorithm? Sorry, I, somebody said something. Yes. Why is it i, j, and not j, i? Oh, I'm sorry. You're, yes, 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 yes. j, i was created. So it's hard to break alphabetical discipline. Yes. OK, so what you're saying is edge j i perhaps was saturated before I did the shortest augmenting path. And some flow was then removed from that saturated edge. Right? That's one way for uh, an edge to appear, is that it was previously full and not in the residual graph, and it joins the residual graph. Now, how does, what does that mean from the perspective of the augmenting path that I compute? What, what is that augment? What, what, what is the shape of that augmenting path if it causes this edge to appear? So that augmenting path must go through the i j edge, right? It has to send some flow from i to j in order to create some capacity from j to i, right? So, so one thing that could happen is, as you said, that the 
uh, JI edge was saturated and we're taking away some flow. Another possibility is that there was no JI edge, but by sending flow on I to J, we create a residual arc in the opposite direction. Okay? So either way, the implication is that the shortest augmenting path went through the edge IJ. Now, if the shortest augmenting path went through IJ, what does that tell us about the edge IJ? Yes? Great. So if you think about these short augmenting paths, they're, along a sh they're, they're on a shortest path tree, right? That's, it's a shortest augmenting path, so it's on a shortest path tree. So in that shortest path tree, I was the parent of J. That means that I was closer to S than J before the shortest augmenting path. So can somebody now finish the contradiction? Yes. So the new distance of I, as a result of going through J, is greater than what it already was. So yeah. So one possibility, I mean, if this was true before and afterwards uh, I is farther than J, then one of two things happened, both of which are contradictory. Right? One is that I got farther away. But that can't be because we said that I got, by definition, I got closer, right? The other possibility to I getting farther away is what? Yeah? J got, J got closer. So what's wrong with J getting closer? And why is that a problem? Because we assumed I was the closest thing that got closer. Right, so either way, right, we violate that I is the closest thing to S that got closer. And so that's the end of our proof of contradiction. Yes? Why does it have to be J-I created by the sort of time path? Like, could you have some other edge on the path of S to J created by the Ah, but that's kind of what's going on here, right? If I create, if, if, if I get closer because of an edge that gets created over here, then that edge must also be bringing J closer. Oh, okay. Right? And that, that is why we took the closest uh, vertex that approached S. All right, so we've proven this key lemma. Uh, and from it, everything flows very nicely. Now I can claim that uh, shortest augmenting path does at most MN over 2 augmentations. And I'm really just going to build on what we did here. Okay. So let's consider, so what, ha what do we know happens in every one of our augmentations? Well, we augment as much as we can, and so we saturate an edge. Yes? So let's consider edge ij which was saturated by some shortest augmenting path. Okay. Back when we were starting with max flow, with max flow we, had this, we, we briefly thought, oh, if I saturate an edge, then it's gone and I don't have to worry about it anymore. Right? That would make max flow really simple, right? If, if, if when you saturated an edge by augmentation, you could stop worrying about that edge, all of our algorithms would be really fast. Okay, what, what, what goes wrong with that sort of simplistic uh, argument? Yes? Good. So the problem is that it can get unsaturated. Right? It can come back into the graph, so they have to think about it more than once, and that affects your time bounds. How can it get unsaturated? What has to happen in order for this edge ij to come back into the network? Yeah? Uh, 
you have to decide that you need the reverse direction is on the operating path. Great. So it can get unsaturated only by a shortest augmenting path on the edge ji. Right? But what has to happen before using that edge? Or sorry, not, instead, I shouldn't say before using. So if I use edge ji, that means by definition it's on shortest augmenting path. Right? How can that happen? Right? So, so ha what has to happen during this sort of sequence where I I saturate edge ij on some shortest augmenting path, and then later I send flow on ji in light of this lemma that we just proved. What, 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 what sort of has to evolve um, over the course of these augmenting paths? Yeah? Great. So if I call this step A, right, and uh, this step B, right, so in step A, I was closer to S than J. Right? In step B, J is closer to S than I. How can that happen? We just said that all of the distances are non-decreasing. So how can we cause this change in order? Yes? Exactly. So this implies, right, so J's distance did not decrease. That's what we just proved in the previous lemma. So that implies that I's distance had to increase. And in fact, since it had to pass J, it had to increase by 2. Okay. All right. So that. And, and, and now we have sort of the story of what happens, right? I augment along ij, and then um, I uh, augment along ji, and that makes it possible for me to augment along ij again. But before I could do that, i's distance had to increase by 2. Okay. So what does that tell me about how often I can augment on ij? How big can i's distance get? Right? So once i's distance, or let me shorthand, once d of si is greater than n minus 1, that means that i cannot be reached from s. And that means that there will be no more augmenting paths through i. So from that I can conclude that the number of augmenting paths through edge ij is at most n over 2, right? Each augmentation through ij is preceded by an increase of 2 in the distance from i to j. Therefore, and after n over 2 of those, the distance, from, the distance from s to i is going to exceed n. Okay. So I've proven that there can only be n over 2 augmentations that saturate i. Okay. And I should say these, these are saturating augmenting paths. So each edge can get saturated n over 2 times. Every augmenting path saturates some edge. So in total, there are going to be mn over 2 augmenting paths. Okay. 
So we're done, right? How long does it take to compute an augmenting path, to, to find the shortest augmenting path? Yeah? Breadth first search, right? And notice there's no lengths here, right? I mean, it's just number of edges on the path. So to find a shortest augmenting path, uh, it takes you order m time. And that means that to find a max flow, takes you order m squared n time. No dependence whatsoever on the values of the capacities. So this is what's known as a strongly polynomial algorithm. Because it doesn't care about the numbers. Right? It's a, it performs some number of arithmetic operations that depends only on the structure of the graph and not on the numbers being manipulated. Questions? Yes? Is this the first time we proved that we can find a real, uh, for, for real? Uh, well, in a sense, yes. So, I mean, we haven't answered the question of how you're going to store those real numbers and how you're going to add them and so forth. But if you work in a model of computation where you are allowed to do real arithmetic in constant time, then this is the first algorithm that we've given that demonstrably solves max flow in polynomial time. Yes? Uh, is this only for the case of uniformly weighted edges? Ah, interesting question. So I did make a uniformity assumption, but the assumption I made was uniformity of lengths, right? I, I was talking all the time about the number of edges on the path. But I actually made no assumptions at all about the capacities, right? The only thing, the only place where capacities really came up in this whole discussion is that when I find an augmenting path, I send as much flow as possible along that augmenting path. And the amount of flow that I can send is determined by the minimum residual capacity on the path. Right? But that doesn't have to be one. It can be any number you like. As long as I'm saturating the edge, I'm fulfilling the conditions of these lemmas. And I, and I arrive at my max flow in m squared, over n, in m squared n time. Okay. Great. Other questions? All right, so now that we've got our strongly polynomial the, uh, uh, algorithm, the natural next question to ask is, how much better can we get? Right? We've got a polynomial time bound, but I mean, if you think about it, it's n to the fifth, right? If, if, if you have a dense graph where m is around n squared. So it's not really a wonderful polynomial time bound. This was, uh, this was work by Edmonds and Karp, by the way. I should try and cite things when I know who did them. They gave the first strongly polynomial algorithm for max flow. But they were followed by a whole line of work on how to improve this polynomial time bound. Um, and so that takes us to our next topic, which is blocking flows. This is a general technique uh, that yields several better time bounds for max flow. Uh, and it starts from a sort of an, a natural question, which is, um, am I really leveraging um, the subroutines that I'm using? So how, how does shortest augmenting path work? I run, a shortest, I, I run a shortest path computation. Based on that shortest path computation, I take one path and I saturate that path. Okay. Could I get some more mileage out of that shortest path computation? Do something better than just saturating one path that I find? Yes? You saturate all edges of the shortest path? Yes, I could try to saturate all of the shortest paths at the same time, right? This shortest path computation, if you think about it, is actually going to find all of the shortest paths from S to T. Okay? It'll find them all at the same time. So why don't I destroy them all at the same time? Okay. So the idea of blocking flows is um, to find all the shortest paths of a given distance. 
and then to destroy all of them. Now, if I destroy all of the shortest paths, what do you suppose happens to the distance? It's going to increase, right? So with shortest augmenting path, we had this non-decreasing distance argument, but blocking flow tries to be more aggressive and actually force the distance to increase on each step. Um, so that's going to increase the distance, which is going to mean that n blocking flows suffice to set the distance from s to t greater than n minus 1, and therefore yield a max flow. Okay. So that's the core idea of blocking flows, is to find and destroy all of the shortest paths at the same time. Okay. So how do we do that? So the first step is pretty straightforward. We're going to use our shortest path algorithm to build what's, what is called the admissible graph. And this was defined, and the first blocking flow algorithm was given by a Russian named Dinitz. So you're going to build this admissible graph. So the admissible graph is um, layers of vertices by distance from S, um, and edges that go between the layers. So I take my graph, I take S. Everything that can be reached by one step from S is layer 1. Okay. Uh, everything that can be reached by one more step is layer 2. Okay. And we go forward building however many layers we need. Sometimes they'll grow, sometimes they'll shrink. We don't really know, don't really care. Eventually, we'll get to a layer that has t in it. Okay. So if I'm layering out these vertices according to their distance from s, what kind of edges can be in this graph? Where, where, what, what, what vertices can be connected by uh, directed edges? Yes? So I have the, I've drawn these edges that cross from one layer to the next layer. Right? What other edges might be present that I haven't drawn? Or actually, maybe I should phrase it the other way. What edges cannot be present? Edges that skip layers can't be present. Why can't they be present? Because then I would be pulling a vertex into a different layer. Right? So the edges that I have are the edges that go forward one layer or the edges that don't go forward. So I can also have edges that stay in a layer or edges that go backwards. Okay. But I'm not going to worry about those. Um, so I'm going to say that the layers, the edges that go from a layer j to layer j plus 1, and only those edges, are the admissible edges. And I claim that sort of for my, for my goal of destroying shortest paths, it's correct to focus attention on the admissible edges. Why don't I have to worry about any of the other edges in the graph? Yeah? Exactly. So any path that uses a non-admissible edge is not a shortest path, right? So that's a good reason to focus on the admissible edges. It also leads me to the next conclusion, which is that if I destroy all the admissible ST paths, by augmenting and saturating some of these admissible edges, then 
the distance from s to t will increase. Okay. Now, about this I need to be a little bit careful, okay? Um, because when I'm destroying the admissible edges, I might start creating and I have to think about the consequences of that, okay? But um, I'm going to be doing my destruction by finding augmenting paths on the admissible graph. So I'm going to completely ignore the other edges. I'm not going to be using them in my augmenting paths. Now, if I completely ignore the other edges so that I only find augmenting paths using admissible edges, then I claim that the distance increases. Why is that? Well, I'm destroying through augmentations an edge on every admissible path. So all I have to worry about is, did I create any new admissible paths as I augment along these admissible paths? So what edges do I create? If I, if I find an admissible path and augment along it, where do I create edges? Yeah? I create edges going backwards. What can I say about edges going backwards? They're not admissible. Okay, so when I find augmenting paths on, admissible, on the admissible graph, this doesn't create any new admissible arcs, new admissible edges. And so that's it. If through augmentations I can destroy all of the existing admissible paths, then I will have destroyed every current shortest path. I won't have created any new shortest paths, and so the distance from S to T will increase. Is that clear? So before we, before we design our algorithm for destroying those admissible paths, is it clear why that is sufficient? Anybody want to ask about that? Sorry, yes. Just, so you're saying that you won't create any new admissible edges, but how can you even, how can you, all your, path, all your edges are taken out of your path is going to be admissible edges. So how can you create edges that go back? Well, that's a, oh, you can. Right, because remember, we're augmenting on, we're, we're doing augmenting paths. So when we find an admissible path, we're going to push flow on that admissible path. And that's going to create residual arcs in the reverse direction. That's what happens when you send flow on a path, right, is that you create residual capacity. Right? This, this, this residual arc that you create in the opposite direction, what that's saying is that if I find an augmenting path through that residual arc, that corresponds to removing some of the flow that I sent on the forward arc. Okay? But those residual arcs are in the wrong direction. They don't create new shortest paths. So does everybody believe me? I, I know that I've earned your trust by now, but, but, but does everybody believe uh, that they too can prove that if you destroy all of the admissible arcs, then you have cr increased the distance from S to T. Yeah? Great. So how do we do that? How do we destroy the admissible arcs? And this is where thinking about the admissible graph and thinking about blocking flows is, is nice. So with augmenting paths, we always have this worry that, well, we found an augmenting path, but maybe it made a reverse arc. And so we have to, we, we have to bring back the edge that we destroyed. Right? But with the admissible graph, we know that there's no way to bring back the edge that we destroyed. Right? We, we only are working on these admissible paths. Once we destroy an edge, it's gone for good. And so it's going to be easier to compute a blocking flow than it was to compute a maximum flow. Okay. So for starters, let's think about blocking flows in unit capacity graphs. You're, this, this, again, we're sort of following the same paradigm as we did before, sort of creeping up on the general problem by considering special cases, right? And so unit capacity is always going to be easier than general capacities. So how would you go about hunting for a blocking flow, destroying all the admissible paths uh, in 
in, 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 one of these, in one of these admissible graph, in, in one of these layered graphs. Well, we don't have a lot of machinery, right? I mean, we, we could, but let's, let's start attacking it like we attack flows, right? So if you wanted to find a flow in this graph, what you would, would you do? Well, you would look for an augmenting path, right? So you'd start at S, and well, we, we need to destroy the path from S to T, so let's do a uh, depth first search until we get to T from S, right? Once we've done that, we have, uh, we've destroyed a path, right? So we can use a DFS. Uh, just like a search for an augmenting path. All right. But we're going to leverage the fact that we know more about the structure of this graph uh, and about the fact that edges can't come back. Okay. And so I'm going to actually describe this depth first search a little bit differently. Um, I'm going to start at S. And while it's possible, I'm going to advance on an outgoing edge. Okay, so I start at S, I look for an outgoing edge, I advance on that edge. I'm at a new vertex, I look for an outgoing edge, I advance on that edge. I keep advancing, 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 right? Until, well, one of two things can happen. Okay, one I already described. One is that I maybe reach T, right? I advance, I advance, I advance, and eventually I get to vertex T, okay? Well, if I reach T, then I found an augmenting path. Okay. So augment it. Okay. And, uh, of course, when I augment it, since I'm talking about a unit capacity graph, this destroys all the edges on the augmenting path. They, they all get saturated at the same time by my one unit of flow, right? What's the other possible outcome as I am advancing and advancing? Uh, and, and so if I do this, I'll go back. If I, if once I've found this augmenting path, I'll go back to the start, or I'll just start over. But after I've done this for a while, right, I've advanced, I found an augmenting path, I advance again. I, what, what's going to start happening as I try to advance, advance, advance through vertices? Yeah. Um, you're going to have dead Right. So the other possibility is that I might have a dead end. Okay. So let's augment our picture with a dead end. Okay. So maybe I get to here. Okay. So I've advanced from S along a bunch of edges. I reach this vertex. There's a dead end. What should I do? Well, there's not much I can do. I'm going to have to retreat, right? I can't go forward. So I retreat back to the previous vertex, right? I've, I've been growing a path from S. I back up one step. Okay. But I claim I have now learned something very important. There's something I can record, right? So I reach this vertex that was a dead end. I back up along this edge. You know, now I'm going to continue running my algorithm. Maybe I'll reach T some other way. I'll start doing some other searches from S. But what can I record that helps me from my retreat? Yes? Good. So if I reached a dead end, then I also have a dead edge. Okay. If the edge goes to a dead end, then it's never worth um, uh, following that edge again. So when I retreat along an edge, I can burn my edge behind me, which is always a good idea when you're retreating, right? You don't want the enemy following you. So now I've got a complete algorithm, okay? So I advance. Sometimes I'll reach T, and if I reach T, I'll augment and destroy all of the edges on my current path. 
If I reach a dead end, I will retreat and destroy the edge that I am retreating along. Okay. Now we can use that to give ourselves a runtime analysis. Okay. And uh, if you think about it, I've carefully defined my, oh, so before we do the analysis, let me point out that you know, this looks kind of like an augmenting path algorithm, but the difference is in the way we use these retreats, right? The fact that when we retreat, we can destroy an edge. There was nothing like that in the augmenting path algorithm because just, you know, just because I can't use an edge now, I mean I won't be able to use it in the future because my augmentations may create paths for that edge that didn't previously exist. But that doesn't happen in the admissible graph because we're only looking at shortest paths. Yes? Yes, the DFS is happening on the admissible graph. And again, I am describing a single blocking flow computation, a, a flow to block all of the shortest paths. That's not a max flow computation. But what I argued above is that if I find n blocking flows, then I will find a maximum flow. Yes, so at each of the blocking flow stages, I compute an admissible graph and run a blocking flow on that admissible graph. All right, so how do we do the runtime analysis? Um, where did I put the runtime analysis? Interesting. OK, let's make up the runtime analysis. So um, the sort of primitive steps are the advances, the retreats, uh, sorry, the augments. and the retreats, right? If I could just count up each of these, how many advances, how many augments, how many retreats, uh, then I will be done, right? Um, I, I'll have measured the total time spent by the algorithm. So how do I measure the time spent on advances, augments, and retreats? How many of each can there be? Is, the, is there one of these where perhaps there's an easy answer that we can get out of the way quickly? Yes? Good. So there can only be M retreats. Why can there only be M retreats? Yeah? It burns, each retreat burns an edge. Each edge can only be retreated once. Okay. What else can we bound? Yes? Also only M advances? Uh, only M advances. Why can there only be M advances? When you get to the end, you destroy all of them. Uh, but we might not get to the end. We might retreat. OK, so, but can we break that apart into some, in, in, into some pieces, perhaps? You never advance on the same edge twice. Good. So that's a good way to put it. Why don't you ever advance on the same edge twice? Good. So once you advance on an edge, you know one of two things is going to happen, right? Either you're going to reach T and do an augmentation and destroy the edge, or you're going to fail to reach T and do a retreat and destroy the edge, right? So I'm just going to say that the, that the advances are covered by the augments and the retreats. Right? Every advance turns into an augmentation or a retreat. So all we have to think about is the augmentations. So how do we bound the number of augmentations that can happen? Yeah? Uh, I can amortize the augmentation work over the edges deleted, and therefore, good. So the augmentation work can also be seen as less than or equal to m because each edge is involved in only one augmentation, and it gets destroyed when I uh, do the augmentation, right? 
So that gives me a total bound of order m work for a blocking flow. Right? And that's just as much work as for a single augmenting path, right? We, we were already spending m work just to find an augmenting path. And with the same amount of work, we can find all of the shortest augmenting paths at once and destroy them. Now, if it takes me m time to do the blocking flow, what can I then say as the time bound for the max flow? Yeah? Mn. Mn for max flow, because I already said that you only need to do and blocking flows in order to find the max flow. Okay. So that's nice. Yes? The depth first search is on the admissible graph, which gets which changes as you destroy edges because you're augmenting through them. Oh, yes, at the start. So again, now, now that we've got the whole picture, let, let's sort of run through what happens. To find my max flow, I take the residual graph that I have. I construct the admissible graph for that residual graph. I find a blocking flow in that admissible graph. And now I have finished one blocking flow page. I start all over again. So I take the residual graph right, from the, uh, the new residual graph. I construct a new admissible graph. And I find a new blocking flow in that new admissible graph. Okay? But remember that constructing the admissible graph also was a linear time uh, operation. So that's also, it's, it's linear time per, per blocking flow, and therefore order mn per max flow. Okay? Now, you might have a complaint because, um, wait, we already know, we already had order mn um, uh, using a regular augmenting path algorithm. Right, on uh, simple unit capacity graphs. Right? Because the standard augmenting path algorithm took order mf time. Right? And on a simple graph, f is at most n. So we get the same order mn. OK, so we can say that for blocking flows, uh, we get a bound that's true even on a non simple graph. Right, a graph with parallel edges where the flow could be larger than n, it still only takes order mn time to find it. Okay? But that wouldn't be a justification for all the work uh, that we've done to analyze blocking flows. Fortunately, blocking flows also yield really great uh, bounds uh, through a more careful analysis. And so that's what we'll do. Uh, but let's take a two minute break first to get our energy back with um, uh, the sort of unweighted uh, graph case. Okay. All the capacities are 1. So we proved an mn bound, but we can actually do better. Okay. Uh, so suppose that we've done k blocking flows. What can we say about the state of the graph Okay, which has m edges. That's the only parameter that's going to matter. So we've got this m edge graph. We did k blocking flows. What is the state of that graph after k blocking flows? What has changed? Yes? Okay, so I'm going to be sloppy and say the distance from s to t is at least k. All right? Why is that useful to know? What can we infer from this distance of k? Thinking back to my beginning motivation, which I've just erased. Well, no, I haven't actually. It's still there. So why is, it, why is having a distance of some large k progress? Yeah? Great. So let's formalize this. I have a long and narrow uh, pipe, right? So my graph, uh, sorry, here's S. 
here's t, right? Um, and if I just think about the layered graph, right, there's k layers from s to t. Oops. Why does that help me? Hold on. So I think between any two layers, there's only, there's at most m over k edges. Great. So what I'd like to, I mean, that's, that's absolutely the right intuitive perspective, right? Is that if I, I'm going over distance k and I have m edges, then on average, there's only m over k edges crossing between layers, right? And so, I should be able to argue that there's not much flow. How do we formalize that? Right, I just said on average, right? Averages don't help us very much here. Yeah? So there exists a layer with less than or equal to m over k uh, admissible edges, right? What can I infer from that? I can cut that layer. Right? If I just draw that cut, I have an ST cut with only m over k crossing edges. So that tells me that the min cut is at most m over k, which tells me that the residual max flow is less than or equal to m over k. Well, now we just notice that every blocking flow finds at least one unit of flow, at least one augmenting path, right? Because it, you know, it starts with the shortest augmenting path. Um, so that tells us that there are only m over k additional blocking flows. Uh, to finish the problem. So we do k blocking flows, and after that we only have to do m over k blocking flows. Right? Now what's k? Actually before that, let's do a time bound. Right? If we're going to do k blocking flows and then we're going to do m over k blocking flows, the total time for that is order km plus uh, uh, m over k times m, because each of the blocking flows takes me uh, m time. Now what's k? Well, k is whatever I want, right? I, I made it up. I can set it to whatever value I want. So what value should I set it to? Well, I should set it to balance these two terms. That's how I minimize this asymptotically. So if I set k equal uh, square root of m, I get a runtime of order m to the 3 halves. And that's strictly better than mn, right? On sparse graphs, it's a lot better. Okay. So that idea of looking at how the blocking flow increases the distances can be used in several other ways. Okay. Uh, so some variants of this analysis tell us also that a blocking flow algorithm will only take mn to the 2 thirds on uh, simple unweighted graphs. Uh, and also, if you remember that bipartite matching graph that we created, and I, I, I talked about this bipartite matching problem last time, where we had this bipartite graph and we were trying to pair up the lefts and rights, and we did so by creating a source and a sink that went from left to right. Well. Using the same argument as we did up there, but looking at, at, looking at, the, at vertex cuts instead of edge cuts, you can prove that it's only m root n time uh, to find a max flow on these bipartite cuts. Okay, or I should say these matching graphs. So, you know, no further algorithmic development, but just looking carefully at the way distance is influenced by blocking flows, we get these better bounds for uh, special cases of max flow that are important. Okay. But now let's move on to capacitated graphs. Okay. 
how do we solve, how do we apply our blocking flow ideas, which so far we've only done with 0, 1 graphs, how might we apply them to capacitated graphs? Any techniques we might try? Yeah? Scaling, right? Anytime you have something that works for 0 and 1, you can try scaling as a way to make it work for, uh, for, for large values, OK? Um, and so we're going to use it exactly the same way as before, right? We're going to scale one bit at a time. And then we are going to use our blocking flow algorithm to update the max flow on each scaling step. And we're not actually going to need to change the algorithm at all. We're just going to have to look a little harder at our analysis in order to get a nice bound for scaling based blocking flows. Okay. Um, the detail that we need to consider. Okay. Well, let's go back and look at our analysis and ask what goes wrong. Like if, if we wanted to just take the analysis that we did for unit graphs and say that it also works for capacitated graphs, why wouldn't that be true? Yeah? How come? Great. So this is the flaw for applying this with capacitated graphs, right? If you do an augment in a capacitated graph, you don't destroy all of the edges on the path. You only destroy the minimum capacity edge. Okay. Do we have a problem with retreats? Does our retreat analysis need to change for capacitated graphs? I see some head shakes. Does somebody want to say why our retreat analysis does not have to change for capacitated graphs? Yeah? You're still burning an edge every time you retreat. Yeah, right? The, 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 this idea that you can destroy an edge when you retreat is still true for capacitated graphs because it's only about reachability, right? Can I reach the sink? Oh, I can't reach the sink. OK, I can destroy the edge. So it remains true that an edge is only retreated once. There's only one retreat per edge because the edge can be destroyed when you retreat in a single blocking flow stage. So on retreats, we're fine. And what about advances? Well, we already said we're not going to worry about advances because we just need to worry about augments and retreats. So if we continue to just worry about augments and retreats, we've covered advances. So the real problem is just the augments. <coughs> right? So what can we say about the augments? Well, we've got this augmentation. Um, we're doing this n work in the augmentation, right? We have to update the capacities on uh, n edges. And we're only destroying one edge. So how can we account for that? Well, we'll account for it directly. We'll charge the end work of the augmentation to the edge that got destroyed. Okay. So each time there's an augmentation, some edge gets hit, or sorry, not, not to the edge, uh, sorry, I, I misspoke. We're not going to charge it to anything. We're just going to remember we did n work for this augmentation. Okay? So let's charge it to the augmentation. 
OK, so we're charging n work per augmentation. I claim that that's actually progress. When we were doing standard augmenting paths algorithm, how much did each augmentation cost? Way back on Monday. How much time did it take us to find an augmenting path? It took us m. Now it's only taking us n. Right? The blocking flow sort of does away with the labor of finding the augmenting path, and all that is left is the work of actually doing the augmentation on these n edges. OK? So now we have n work per augmentation. And that means that to find a max flow, or, uh, a max flow using blocking flow in a capacitated graph, requires, in total, n blocking flows And those blocking phases involve m times n retreats, because there are n blocking phases, and each of them you have up to m retreat work. It also involves n times f uh, augmentation work. So our total for finding a blocking flow is order n times m plus f to find a flow of value f. Now, by itself, that's not very exciting. I mean, it, it, it's actually it's kind of nice, right? Um, because this is true even in capacitated graphs. We have a dependence on the value of the flow. But this is already better than the order mf bound that we had using naive augmenting paths. But where it really gets great is when we combine it with scaling. So if we bring in the scaling idea, now we have a series of scaling phases. Right? What can we say about a single scaling phase? Right? We found a max flow. Now we shift a new bit into the network. Now we want to find a new max flow. What is the value of the max flow that we need to find in this new shifted network? We actually made this argument last time when we were looking at scaling algorithms for augmenting paths. If we've just scaled in one bit per edge, what is the value of the max flow? Can it be arbitrarily large? How come? Yeah? So, so we, 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 we speculated the same last time. OK, so why, why, at most, why would you say at most n? Good. So the, the intuition is that if I'm scaling in a new bit, Right? I can look at the source and say, well, there's only n edges leaving the source. And each of them only gains one from scaling in a bit. So that brings in a total of n flow. There's a small flaw in that argument. What's the flaw? Yeah? Well, I think the attempted argument is to say, look at this cut, which only has n edges crossing it. <coughs> OK? The problem is that these edges might not be zero capacity before the scaling step. Right? What, what we know before the scaling step is that there is some cut that has zero capacity, but maybe it's off somewhere in the middle of the graph with lots and lots of edges crossing it. OK? We had a max flow, so that, that cut had zero capacity. Well, now. We do the scaling step. Each of the edges crossing the cut, which had capacity 0, now might have capacity 1. So that tells us that the old uh, zero value cut 
increases to a cut value of at most m, because each edge crossing that cut only gains one bit. Okay. So that means that the new max flow is at most m. And that means that our blocking flow finds it in order n times m plus m, which is order nm time. Okay. Um, and from that, we can conclude that, uh, the f that that's for a single um, blocking flow. So if we, if we look over all of the uh, the, sorry, I left out an M. Uh, so we do the, we find the max flows. NM plus F. All right. Rather than keeping you here, I'm going to send one, I'm going to send a, a correction to this bound by email. I, I've dropped an M somewhere and I want to fix it. And I don't want to hold you here while I fix it. Let me finish with one question for you. Um, I have to travel on Friday. And so I'm going to give you one of two options. The, the TAs will lecture. One thing that they can do, they, they can either lecture the next piece of sort of required material that was like an official lecture for the class, or they can do an optional lecture. The next topic we're going to be covering in the class is min cost flow, and that's what we'll, that, 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 that's where we'll go. But there's an interesting uh, optional lecture on what's called push relabel algorithms. These are the algorithms that you actually use to solve max flow in practice. Okay, and they have a number of very interesting um, uh, ideas behind them that make them far superior to blocking flows and shortest augmenting paths in practice. So I'm going to take a simple vote. On Friday, who would like to have an optional lecture on push relabel? And who, oh, okay, well that was easy. Okay, so on Friday, you will be presented with push relabel. Um, look for an email. Um, as I said, I'm going to be holding office hours now for anybody who wants to talk about the class in general, and you should look for a problem set to be posted shortly. <laughs>